Uh, you're listening to The Current. I'm Jill Riley. Current's morning show here on Minnesota Public Radio. And I'm very pleased to be joined by guest checking in who well, has a memoir out, a new record that came out this year, and an upcoming show at First Avenue. Well, I'm with singer-songwriter, activist, poet, writer, icon, Ani DeFranco. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jill. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, how are you? Like- I'm doing all right. Besides uh, two-dimensional, like right. everybody these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on one hand, you know, I'm grateful that the technology exists that we can, you know, connect in this way since we haven't had anyone, you know, able to come into our building, into our studio for like a year and a half. So this has been a great way to stay connected. But, you know, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm really missing that face-to-face, you know, kind of in in the same airspace uh, kind of connection with people. But I'm really, um, it gives me a lot of hope that so many artists are announcing shows and, you know, like, uh, you know, First Avenue's main room is is starting to be booked. So that's really great. And uh, it was really cool to get the word that you're coming back to town. So I know we have a lot to cover. We'll talk about your your return to First Avenue. Um, it was I think, two years ago this month that my colleague Jay Gabler uh, covered your book for Rock and Roll Book Club, uh, and uh, and I was I was thinking about that, and so it's your memoir, uh, No Walls and the Recurring Dream, and I guess if, if we could start there, um, yeah, that memoir came out two years ago, and I wonder if we could just kind of touch on it um, because I know that you you talk about some folks that we hold very dear in Minnesota, um, but what was it like, uh, you know? You're a songwriter, you writer, poet, but what was it like to write your story, to actually sit down and, and write a memoir? Well, I timed it a little wrong. I, I, I worked for two years on a book and then the pandemic hit and I had to stay home <laughs> for, you know, um, ditch my normal touring job. That would have been better timing, but um, it was crazy, you know, but sort of cool to have a very different kind of writing challenge in my life after hundreds and hundreds of songs and poems and such. Um, So I just, but you know, I was still working and touring. So I was just had my laptop, you know, attached to me and a bunch of little thumb drives with different versions of this book as it evolved while I lived my life, you know, I, I certainly didn't have a cabin in the woods to go to, to (laughs) write my little novel. It just had to happen in between gigs and jobs and kids and all the rest, you know? Yeah. And so the memoir, um, you you know, you really start from, you know, when you were growing up, I mean, what, up till the age of, of 30, and I assume you did that because there, there is more of the story to be told, you know, um, but uh, I, I'm always impressed when I read a memoir or some kind of biography, the amount of detail that can be recalled because, and maybe it's just me, but not that I'm going to sit down and write a memoir anytime soon, but to sort of recall and revisit those times, um, is that a challenge for you or or were those things once you got into it were they kind of coming back to you easily super challenging super challenging i felt exactly like you uh you know when after i agreed to do it you know i met this this hot publisher lady and she said you can do this and i said right sure yeah let's go and then i sat down and i panicked because i don't remember a thing I don't remember any more than any of us, you know, about, and I thought I just, most of the first year was, I can't do this. I can't do this. But I guess I'm, I'm sort of living proof that if you sit there long enough and you stare into space deep enough, you will find one thing and then you will find another thing and then you put them next to each other and then you go, oh, no, wait, 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 that thing came before that thing. Oh, no, wait, I didn't know that person. How did it? Uh, And slowly but surely, you can walk yourself back to a time that's all but forgotten to your sort of daily conscious mind. Were there any things in particular that kind of helped you reconnect with your past whether it be a photo or a song or 
You know, even as I was preparing for this interview, I started thinking about this guy that I worked with at a pizza shop over 20 years ago. It was like the guy that played me your music for the first time, you know, as we were like closing up the pizza joint, I started thinking about that person and suddenly all these memories were opening up. So there were any sort of like, I don't know if you did any journaling or if there was any kind of tools that were helpful there. You know, not really. I thought at, at the onset, again, I thought that's what I would do. I thought I have to call up or maybe drive and go see everybody, all the important people along the way that are still with me and interview them and write and just get all the memory and information out of other people's heads, out of other sources. I thought, okay, wait, my journals and what do I read interviews or how am I going to get back there? But again, in the end, I didn't do any of that, really. I mean, I consulted uh, some written stuff from, but really it was about going inward, I guess. And it was a long, arduous process. But what I need, the story that I, I needed to tell was in deep, deep in me, not in anybody else, really. Well, the book is called No Walls and the Recurring Dream. Uh, it's Ani DeFranco's memoir. So if you haven't picked it up yet, it is out there. It is available. And uh, I'm talking to Ani DeFranco, by the way, here on The Current. Um, you also put out a new album uh, called Revolutionary Love. And, uh, I, you know, before we jump into it, I <laughs> listening to the record, it's got such a great groove to it. It really... Um, to tell you the truth, kind of, it, it made me feel really relaxed and just like, like I could kind of just breathe while I was listening to it. Um, what, what does that mean to you? Where does that come from? Just the term revolutionary love? Well, first of all, I'm so happy that that's how the album made you feel. That's what I was hoping for was, um, you know, I've had a lifetime of activism and, and political songs and such. And what I, I really wanted to, you know, I can't not be that. I can't not do that or care about my society or um, leave politics out of what I express or think or care about. But I just wanted this record to, to help sort of quiet the noise, you know, not to ignore it, not to deny it, but, but to, I don't know, be somehow soothing that, that we can, you know, we can get through this, we can get through this together, not, um, you know, not by denying or skirting our responsibility as citizens, as people, as community members, as brothers and sisters, but, you know, just a feeling of possibility and peace. And so I'm, I'm really glad. I mean, revolutionary love is something I'm trying to achieve. I think I've been trying all along in these songs and in my work and in my life, but I had a friend come along uh, in recent years named Valerie Kaur, and um, she's an activist, a civil rights crusader, lawyer, author. I mean, she just wrote a book herself. Um, it's called uh, revolutionary love a memoir and manifesto or or see no stranger a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love and valerie just the way she articulates it and breaks it down revolutionary love what is it how do you do it on a daily basis was very helpful to me very you know you you need somebody to come along and give you the words, the language that you need to know your own thoughts, your own path, your own context in this world, you know? So Valerie sort of did that for me and the song reflects her words, her ideas around revolutionary love. And I just felt like it speaks so much, that song and um, the language that she gave me um, and it speaks so much to my mission in general that it became the title of the record and, you know, my kind of mantra of late. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like, um, you know, a very, a very hopeful idea. I mean, there has been d division in this country, <laughs> you know, since, uh, it, since the, the birth of the uh, United States, right? But um, in recent years, you know, there are political divides. There are divides on wish, women's issues and uh, and racial justice. And and now I just feel like we're at we're at this place 
that it's really amplified of this divide um, having to do with, with this pandemic. Whereas I remember the first few months, there was really this, we're in this together. And, and I really felt that. And now I feel like both sides are having a hard time coming together and, and maybe having compassion or even like struggling with empathy for each other. Um, and to be so divided over, over the, over the, you know, idea of, of vaccination, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's fascinating to watch, but frustrating to be a part of. Um, and it, it's kind of easy to lose that idea of hope. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly how I feel. And I, why I wanted so much for this new record to make you feel hope or peace or possibility, you know, as opposed to just being constantly overwhelmed by the doom, you know, the doom machine. Yeah, I, I mean, we're just being encouraged at every turn by many people in power, by bots and trolls and who knows what foreign actors or, you know, domestic actors to close to each other, to fight each other, you know, and so this idea of revolutionary love, you know, it begins with the idea of staying open to even your opponent, okay, so this is not like, you know, sack candy, you know, joy and hugging and kumbaya, this is, this is revolution, <laughs> but, but with love and compassion as its motivator, you know? So, so yeah, the first task becomes to remain curious, i.e. open towards your opponent, keep wondering about them. That in itself is an act of strength. It's, an, it's a show of respect and, and love, you know, to continue to ask questions and try to understand your opponent right there you've thwarted what all of these messages are telling you to do, which is to lock down, to assume and judge and close yourself off. So, you know, you start there and uh, you, you know, another thing that Valerie illuminated is a way to engage with your opponents is to focus as much as you can uh, this is, of course, only done in community and not by everybody. You know, there are different roles that people play, you know. So if you are actively being hurt or oppressed, this is not your job at, at this given time. This is somebody else's mm -hmm. job. But the job then becomes to look for the wound in your opponent. You know, try that on as a strategy instead of taking on what seems to be very misguided words or actions, look through them for the wound in that person that is driving those misguided actions and words and try to somehow in the process tend that wound. Again, showing compassion, staying open towards, and I'm talking about your opponents, then of course you have to consider yourself and your allies, your community members, you know, so, these are just things that, you know, I'm not sure if I'll ever achieve, you know, but I'm just, it's the constant striving towards this kind of revolution, a revolution that's inclusive, you know, that is, that is love-based. I'm talking with Ani DeFranco here on The Current. We're talking about uh, Ani's new record, Revolutionary Love. Um, so a, a couple of familiar names popped up when I was getting a little backstory on your album. Um, one of them being uh, Brad Cook from Megaphon and a collective that we know well here in Minnesota, uh, Gangs. Uh, kind of that whole world of, uh, you know, the Justin Vernon, Bon Iver, I like to call it the Eau Claire world. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it was cool to see that uh, that he was involved in, in the making of your record. And I just, I love his brother, uh, Phil Cook as well, just like sitting in a room with that guy is like, I've had my day turned around by interviewing that guy, just like, mm -hmm. you know, that positivity mm -hmm. um, and kind of just that whole kind of collective of, of like-minded individuals. Um, how did you meet Brad Cook and what was his involvement in the making of this record? Yeah, I went to the Iver Fest um, a couple of years ago and I met, uh, I had already met a few, maybe of the Eau Claire Mafia, you know, and oh then I God. met a bunch more. And um, Brad and I met face to face at that gathering, finally. And um, 
So yeah, I enlisted him to help me make this new record. He put, he helped put the band together, including his brother, as you say, Phil just blew my mind. I mean, all of the musicians were so amazing and, um, you know, brought so much to this record. Um, but Phil in particular, it's, it's awesome that you should point him out specifically because I just, he, I considered him, you know, after I finished the record, I emailed everybody and thanked them and was sending them copies. And I said, Phil, you're like the musical director of this phantom band that just assembled for this record and then dissipated into the mm -hmm. ether, you know, Phil, I don't know, my connection with him when we were recording, it was just, I think I had the same experience that you do. He just transformed the space. Well, the record is called Revolutionary Love. And uh, Ani DeFranco, uh, we're very excited to see that you'll be coming back to Minneapolis. In fact, uh, just later this month, August 21st, and you're no stranger to playing First Avenue. Um, you excited to come back? I love First Avenue so much, and I love playing music, and I am very excited at the idea of going out and you know, seeing people and feeling the energy of all of us together and playing music with my band, my incredible friends. And I miss all of that so much. Um, and yeah, right now we're just hoping we can follow through with this whole tour. You know, we're going to try to do it in the, of course, the most conscious way. And, um, you know, so we're really having a lot of conversations about what is the right way to put on a show these, you know, in this moment and, um, you know, try to try to do it so that everybody's safe and we can get a little bit of that, ah, that juice from each other to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and I don't know what various venues are planning to do across the country uh, quite yet, but you know, First Avenue, you know, they got to put this policy in place with all the venues that they run in the Twin Cities. Um, but, you know, pertaining to the main room that, you know, they want people to show that they've been vaccinated and or or um, proof of a, of a negative COVID test, something like 72 hours before the show. And so they're really as a venue trying to make sure that it's a, a safe space yeah. for people to to come and enjoy yeah, the show. I yeah. There may be a little bit of rigmarole to get in the door, you know, um, yeah, vaccination card, you know, masking, um, there might be temperature checks, there might, I'm not sure exactly what protocol is going to be in place, so there'll be a little bit of rigmarole, but I'm, I plan to make it worth it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, your fans are, uh, are waiting for you. It's really exciting. I, I saw that a dollar from each ticket goes to uh, Roots of Music. Can you, can you just tell me what that's, uh, what that is? Yes, absolutely. Roots of Music is a free music school in New Orleans for underprivileged kids. And um, it's just this amazing program that takes kids that have so very little and it teaches them the language of music uh, and they become part of the Roots of Music Marching Crusaders band, um, marching band. And they also get you know, uh, academic tutoring every day after school, they get a hot meal every day after school. So it's a really kind of holistic program that really uplifts kids in New Orleans. Wow, that's great. And, you know, it, just like the connection to uh, to First Avenue and, you know, even thinking about, you know, the connection that you had to, uh, to Prince and, you know, you guys were like-minded in a number of ways and, you know, Prince was so big on supporting music in schools and, I think there was a lot of mutual respect going on there, especially with the way that you've handled your career that, you know, you started your label so many years ago and you were able to have all this creative freedom. And, and that's, you know, that's like all that Prince ever wanted. And, and was that something that you guys really connected over? Yes, absolutely. That's where our connection was born. And I, mm -hmm. boy, the respect from me to him is just endless. I just, you know, he's a hero of mine forever. And um, I was just so blessed to have hit his radar and to have connected over that and, you know, some other things. He was a startling, startling creature as we know and dearly missed. But yeah, yeah First yeah. Avenue makes me think of him as well. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to welcoming you back in the Twin Cities, First Avenue, August 21st. The record is called Revolutionary Love. Ani DeFranco, appreciate your time. Thanks for checking in.
Likewise, thank you.